I'm Easy Rider, and welcome to a new show, Talking Toku. That's right, it's here where I get to interview Toku's finest. Actors, musicians, stuntmen, and hopefully directors too someday. Well, my first guest, who hopefully won't be the last guest, is a world-renowned stuntman who's done work on Garo and Kamen Rider Dragon Knight, just to name a few. But you probably know him best as Peace in Shibuya 15. Let's take a look. Peace! Non nibble pass pass! Die, Hachi! Harmon Ken or Tahan Yakimichi! And he's here to chat with us today. Please welcome a hell of a nice guy, the one and only Mark Musashi. Oh, Mark! <laughs> Great to have you on the show, Mark. Now, first question, I know a lot of us are wondering this. How did you get into this line of work, doing toku stunt work and whatnot? Um, well, I used to uh, compete wushu, and it so happened that one particular uh, in-house performance we had, there was uh, a producer and director that came that were looking for talent to do a commercial. And they were looking for people that could do wushu uh, or that type of Chinese martial art. And so they asked if anyone was interested and I said sure. Um, and so through that uh, I had an opportunity to meet up with uh, the people at AAC Stunts. And uh, I was thinking to myself, hey this is probably a a once-in-a-lifetime experience, so I basically asked them, you know, how, how does one get into this line of work? And so they basically said, hey, come to practice, um, which I did. Uh, I started training with them, and I trained with them for about two years before I felt like it was time for me to, you know, actually try to do it professionally. Uh, and then basically I decided that it was uh, probably going to be more interesting doing uh, acting and stunt work than uh, teaching conversational English. So uh, I made the big leap and um, the rest is history. Well, I say you made the right career, but what do I know? <laughs> so Mark, you go back to the States and Japan a lot, back and forth. Is it hard to work in those two languages, English and Japanese? Um, not really. Um, working in two languages is not necessarily that difficult once you get to the point where you're comfortable in both languages. I'd say what was more difficult would be working in Japanese, um, because Japanese is not, um, uh, you know, I, I, it's not my native language. I, I didn't speak any Japanese until I went to college, actually. Um, so... Especially when I first started out, there would be times when, um, you know, there's not much time on set, uh, like the, the sun's going down, so we only have, you know, 15 more minutes to get all of this shot. And, you know, it, it, would, it would be those times when, you know, normally um, I was always working with everyone in Japanese, and they, they sort of saw me as uh, another Japanese person, and they treated me as such, which... To be honest, I preferred because I had worked there as a uh, foreign talent before, and you know, quite honestly, they they don't really teach you, they don't really treat you like um, a performer. They basically treat you like a large object that is placed in the uh, in the frame as needed. Um, but uh, you know, the fact that they treated me like a Japanese person, and they also expected me to respond. Uh, as a Japanese person would, and so it would be those times when I would not hear something correctly or sort of ask for clarification when there wasn't time for that when people would get really upset and things would sort of blow up and tempers would flare. Um, you know, and then after the fact people would sort of, you know, realize, oh, it's Mark, Mark doesn't, you know, speak Japanese, it's not his first language. I mean, I spoke it, but it wasn't his first language. So. But, you know, again, it would be those times when everyone's under the gun and everyone's trying to get the shot in that occasionally there would be these sort of, you know, difficulties. But for the most part, it wasn't that bad. Um, and, you know, I'd say 
the, the funny thing is because I worked in Japan for so long, so much of the terminology that goes into uh, movie making, I learned in Japan. So when I came over to America, there were a lot of things that I, you know, quite honestly, I knew what to call it in Japanese, but I wasn't really sure what the term was in English, and so I'd sort of have to go this roundabout way of describing the thing, and, and uh, so it was interesting, just the fact that, you know, especially those, um, you know, work specific, the, the terminology, um, you know, you, you pick up what you use, and uh, so for the longest time I was much more comfortable working on a set in Japan than I was in America. Sounds like an amazing place to work at. I know I'd love to work in Japan one day. So, Mark, what has been your most physically demanding role in your entire career? Um, I will definitely say that it was Garo. Um, mainly because I was doing so much on that show. Uh, I was, uh, as you may know, I was um, the character Kodama. Uh, I was also the suit actor for Zero. I was also the main stunt double for both Koga and Rei, um, and I would occasionally, you know, be jumping into the the monster suits or the um, the action Garo suit. We had a, a an action suit and a, a hero suit, one that you know looks better up close. Um, and oh, I would you know I would be you know rigging. I would be you know moving mats, moving equipment. It was basically at that point there were I think there were three of us uh, full time stuntmen. Well, four if you can include the the stunt coordinator um, that were doing most of everything. And only when we needed extra people would we call in you know a, a fifth or a sixth person. So it was, it was a lot of, you know, having to fill a lot of different roles, uh, plus the schedule, just the fact that the, the sort of enemy horror characters only came out at night meant that there were a lot of night shoots. Um, but in Japan, they don't have 12-hour turnaround. In other words, you know, you don't, they don't have to rest you for 12 hours before, you know, calling you back to set. So there would be times where you'd do you know, a, a, a shoot starting, you know, in the evening and then going all the way until the sun comes up and then, you know, a few hours later you're doing another day shoot and then, you know, do a few days of day shoots and then it's back to night shoots and it was just, you, there was no rhyme or reason to the schedule so that was incredibly, um, both, both mentally and physically taxing. And then just the fact that you know, the, the the type of show that it was, it was constantly having to sort of pull out the, uh, you know, all of the, the tricks that you had picked up and learned over the course of the, you know, the, the months before and just being like, well, what can I do here? And, you know, basically it felt like, you know, by the end of that, you know, six month shoot, more or less, um, you know, I, I just, I, it felt like I had done everything I could. Every every trick, every stunt, every everything that I had learned up until that point, I did in that show. And it was amazingly tiring, but it was by far the most fulfilling project that I've ever worked on. And you know, it's it's sort of those times where you really push yourself and and see what you're made of that you really you know, that you really enjoy um, how far you've come. Um, sorry about that. Um, so again, yes, it's, it's those moments where you really appreciate, you know, all of the hard work that you've put in, and it, it's, it's really worthwhile. Um, and so, most physically demanding by far, but again, probably the most fun that I've ever had working on a project. You, sir, are living proof that Tokusatsu is no cakewalk and making a great series, it's not an easy task. <laughs> well, let's move back to the States for a second. What was it like working on Kamen Rider Dragon Knight, and how was it working with the man himself, Steve Wang? Uh, Kamen Rider Dragon Knight was great. It was, uh, you know, a great opportunity for me because it was the type of thing that I had done uh, for many years in Japan 
and it was an opportunity for me to come to America and right off the bat, um, you know, come into an American TV show, which, you know, it's the, you know, several of the stunt people that were working on the show here in LA um, and the, the stunt coordinator were people that I had worked with in Japan, uh, that all, you know, all these Japanese people, but again, the, the staff and the crew um, we're all Americans, so it was a really great opportunity and, and a really great introduction to um, shooting in, in America. And you know, quite honestly, it, because it was my first project here, uh, there was a, there was a bit of a learning curve for me because I was used to doing things a little bit differently, and so I had to you know I had to sort of realize that that the the rules were a little bit different here in LA. And but I think it was a great. Uh, very supportive environment, um, and it, it was a it was a great opportunity to, to work on on a show like that. And you know, quite honestly, you know, yeah. Speaking of of Steve, he, it it was a real pleasure to work with Steve. He's I I mean, quite you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't realize what a genius he is if you just spoke to him not knowing who he was. He's very, very humble, very down to earth, and yet he is absolutely brilliant in terms of his just understanding of the tokusatsu genre. Um, and it would always be a pleasure when Steve would come over to second unit, which is essentially the action unit, um, First unit being where they shoot most of the you know the drama, so we have mostly the actors, and then second unit is where you know mostly it's it's stunt guys and suit actors, things like that. We would occasionally have Steve coming over to second unit, and he would be shooting our parts, and it, it would be great because you know he he would just you know he would get in there with the camera. Uh, I mean, he wasn't afraid. Um, of what was going on because he again he just he understands action and fights he knows where it's safe to, to be without you know getting in the way of the performers and you know it, again he was just um, he knew what he wanted and and was able to get that and I think he he's you know again I would I would work with him again at the drop of a hat and I really do hope that I have the opportunity to work with C Wang again. You and me both, Mark. I'd love to get him on this show one day and interview him, too. <laughs> now, here's one that's been bugging me and a lot of other fans. Is it hard to see out of those helmets when you do your stunts? I mean, how does that even work? Um, yes and no. It, it, it completely depends on the, the, how the mask is made. The uh, Wing Knight mask, for example, um, again, there are two. There are two masks. There's the, you know, the stunt helmet, which is primarily, you know, when we're doing fights and tricks and stunts and things like that, um, we use the the stunt helmet. And then there's the hero helmet, which is made to be shot up close, and there's lots of detail in it. Um, the stunt helmet was very easy to see out of. Um, we actually had several of them throughout the course of the shoot. Um, the earlier ones had a, a, a plastic visor, and the thing about plastic visors is um, because all of your breath is trapped inside the helmet, they tend to fog up, um, which again you get used to, but you constantly have to make sure that you take them off and have someone um, you know, wipe off the the condensation and put a, a layer of uh, anti-fog on on the visor. Um, later in the shoot, they got a helmet where basically, in it, instead of having plastic visors, basically the whole thing was just um, FRP, so it's a fiberglass, and then they drilled tiny holes throughout the whole thing. So basically it's the equivalent of like uh, um, the, the screen door on a microwave. Um, so again, if there's no light on the inside, you can't really see through it, but as long as it's brown on the outside, I can see through the helmet fine. That was by far the easiest helmet to see because uh, you have this very wide range and there's plenty of um, vision range in there. 
The hero helmet, on the other hand, um, basically they place a a visor inside of that. I, I'm actually thinking you probably wouldn't even know this unless you really knew about the the helmet. But um, there's actually this plastic set of eyeballs uh, that goes inside the visor, and within that there are these tiny little slits, um, just where the, the detail folds are, so you can't notice them. Um, that you can't see much of anything, quite honestly. <laughs> and um, uh, I remember once, actually, uh, they, they wanted to, to shoot a part where, um, basically, um, I think it was survive mode, wing knight is sort of down, and then he gets really mad, and he screams and he like hits the ground and then he stands up and he runs out of frame. Um, they basically said, you know, it's it's really tight, you only have to take a couple steps and you're fine. You can stop after you take a couple steps. Me being ambitious, I was like, no, no, it's cool. I can kind of see. So uh, I ended up, uh, you know, doing the part, hit the ground, screamed, uh, turned, ran out of frame and ran full force into a concrete wall. Yeah, um, because I, I didn't see the wall. Uh, so, to answer your question, yes, it can be very hard to see out of those helmets sometimes. And painful too, yowch. Well, let's talk about your role as Peace in Shibuya 15. How did you prep for that role? Did you study any roles from other movies, or did you read the manga it was based off of? Uh, actually, the manga in Shibuya 15 came after the TV show. Uh, the TV show... Actually, I was involved with the, the TV show from a pretty early stage, so we had... Um, we actually went through two different uh, production companies. Uh, the first one, it was a much larger scale project, much bigger budget, uh, and then at the very last minute, uh, funding fell through, it sort of fell apart, um, but the director um, basically brought it to, um, to Toei because he had uh, a good relationship with producers there, and so it was a much smaller budget and therefore it became a much smaller scale project. Uh, also, they, they com almost completely recast the entire thing. Um, and basically, you know, started things all over again. Um, sorry, I'm getting slightly off track. In terms of preparation, I originally was only supposed to do one week, so sort of a bad guy of the week, on the original TV series. Uh, and it was basically supposed to be this, you know, it was basically a spin-off character almost of, like, The Crow. That was the image, was The Crow. Um, I was a huge fan of The Crow, a uh, huge, huge Brandon Lee fan, um, also a big Mark Dacostas fan, got to work with him on Conrad Dragon Knight, which was awesome. Um, so again, it, it was great for me to have a chance to sort of play that type of character. When the funding fell through and they recast the whole thing, they basically decided, hey, why don't we just have Mark be the bad guy of the week every single week? and then we'll just change the tattoo on his chest and he'll be a different character. Um, I can't complain, because it meant that I got to work on every episode. Um, well, I was going to be working on every episode anyway, but essentially I would have bet I had camera time in every episode. Um, in order to do that, though, they wanted... The image for Peace was that he was, A, incredibly ripped, um, and B, slightly, not quite homeless, but slightly disheveled, and then there was the whole thing about the, um, the Proverbs, <laughs> which, again, the Proverbs thing, to some degree, came from the original Crow concept, but the fact that, you know, I do speak Japanese with a slight accent. They decided it would be interesting if I spoke proverbs, but always got them wrong, like really, really wrong. And actually, 
for that, I actually then decided, well, hey, if I'm going to be speaking with, a, with an American accent, I'm going to speak with like a really, really bad American accent. So I actually conscientiously tried to do the worst accent possible while speaking completely nonsensical proverbs. Um, I don't know if that, that counts as, as character uh, research, but that's essentially what I was doing. But then in terms of the physical part, I was actually on a, you know, basically a no-carb diet for about a year, which I really don't recommend. It's really not healthy. Um, I mean, low-carb diets are fine. Um, again, I'd talk to a doctor first, but the way I was doing it was not the right way to do it. Um, but I will say that episode one is this one shot of, uh, you know, my six-pack, and I'm impressed. I, I'm kind of impressed with how I was looking at that time. Um, and that's what it was for. But, again, because, you know, we went through this whole prep period and then it fell through and then it restarted. During that whole time, I had to keep up with this diet because, again, it's not like I could just stop it and then if production starts up next week, I could get that, you know, that physical look back. Uh, so it ended up being a much longer, um, you know, period of time that I ended up um, having to stay on that diet and, you know, yet continue to train. And, and then when, you know, when when shooting was going on, I'd say probably by the second half of the shoot, I mean, it was just so exhausting. I had to start, you know, eating um, carbohydrates to some degree because it's just otherwise I, I wasn't going to be able to, to keep going through it. So if you notice, by the end of the series, I don't quite have the same six pack I had at the beginning of the series, but hey. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that was essentially what went into getting ready for Shibuya 15. Well, I say it paid off, Mark, because that show was a masterpiece. Speaking of which, we all know you work in tokusatsu, but do you watch tokusatsu? And if you do, do you have any favorite shows you'd care to mention? Um, Kamen Rider Ryuki was actually one of my most favorite shows when I was in Japan. Um, it was a great opportunity to then work on the essentially the remake of that show here in America but I guess yes I should probably say yes I do watch Tokusatsu uh, I grew up watching it I grew up watching Uchu Keiji Shida and you know I had this one videotape of it and it didn't even you know it wasn't even the entire series it wasn't until Years later, I think I think I was like in my mid to late twenties before I actually got to see the final episodes. But those, you know, those few episodes I had on that one VHS tape, I watched over and over and over and over. I mean, again, this was before Power Rangers came to America, and there was nothing like that uh, here in America. No, you know. And you also have to understand that I grew up in Maine, where, you know, I'll say it, we're, we're not the most culturally advanced state in the Union. So, you know, we didn't even have, you know, a lot of people talk about growing up watching Jackie Chan movies on, on cable or something, or they would, you know, see these, you know, Bruce Lee movies or Kung Fu. I never saw any of that. I, I, honestly, until I went to college, I never saw a Jackie Chan movie. I never watched a Bruce Lee movie, but because uh, fortunately I, you know, had an opportunity to go back to Japan and visit my relatives when I was younger, I was exposed to tokusatsu. And again, at that point, there was nothing like that here in America, and I absolutely fell in love with it. Unfortunately, now uh, I'm I've become a little too busy to to watch it regularly, and I've I've fallen behind quite. I'd say up until. Um, Blade as when I was watching regularly and then from there was when work started getting really busy and unfortunately I just it, you know fell behind. Um, I did actually get a chance to watch um, a little bit of uh, double in preparation for a job that I did 
and it was it was a lot of fun. It it had been a while before uh, since I had seen Tokusatsu, and honestly, you know, having sort of stepped away from from Japan and Japanese culture for a while, it, it took a little bit of getting used to just the sort of the over the topness of it. But once you get used to it, you realize. I mean, it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, they're they're really fun shows. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do. I, I still enjoy them. I, lo I love the genre. And uh, you know, if the opportunity presented itself, I would love to, to work on one again. And you know, I do from time to time just enjoy seeing you know what's what's the new series, what's what's the next uh, what's the next hero. Haven't seen O's yet. Um, haven't seen. Uh, uh, actually, I was talking to them in Japan about it, but I don't know what the, the current uh, Sentai is. Um, and, well, I'm actually curious to see how things turn out with the new uh, Power Rangers re revamp. So we'll, we'll have to, uh, I'll have to you know, take a little time out of my schedule and be sure to catch up on what's happening in Tokusatsu. Well, here's hoping for you, Mark. <laughs> and hey, if you don't have time to sit down and watch an entire Toku series, you can always just watch Toku Time. <laughs> oh, this one I've got to ask. What was it like getting a kiss from the lovely Yuri Ahaga? Yes, yes. This <laughs> It was awesome. Actually, it was. No, it really was. Oh, <laughs> it was actually really unexpected. Um, so the character that she was playing at that point was sort of, uh, you know, it was a completely different character than the one that she had been playing up until that point. And I remember when we were rehearsing it, she would, you know, she came up to me and then she would go, Choo! So I thought that's what she was going to do. I didn't think she was actually going to kiss me. I thought she was just going to come up, say it, and then like go off and be like, <laughs> anyway. Um, but then, you know, rolled the cameras and she kissed me. And for a split second, I was like, whoa. And then I realized, oh wait, I'm supposed to keep acting. And I was like, <laughs> um, So no, it was, it was unexpected, but it was, it was great. And I have so much respect for her as an actress real dedication. Indeed, she is very beautiful and very talented, I might add. Um, actually, on a side note, I actually I actually also got a kiss from Yuki Saya, who plays Tsuyoshi, the guy. Um, this is not part of the, the TV show, but uh, when I rapped, so when, when I shot my final scene, you know, I got my little bouquet of flowers and everyone clapped. And uh, I don't know why, but somehow they were telling her, oh, you should give him a kiss. <laughs> this was also a very memorable kiss because it ended up being more like a like headbutt to the cheek kind of thing. It was, like, it was sort of like both of us not really gauging distance real well. Um, not the best kiss that I've ever received, but um, hey, can't complain. Uh, awkward. <laughs> but, but seriously, uh, taking a break from tokusatsu, let's talk about your motion capture work. What was it like working on personal favorite of mine, the Metal Gear Solid series? Metal Gear Solid was a lot of fun. Um, just like, you know, I had an opportunity to work on Dragon Knight after I was a big fan of Yuki. Uh, yeah, I was a huge Metal Gear Solid fan. The, the original game when it came out when I was in college was earth shattering. I mean it was it was that old school Nintendo you know the not the Super Nintendo but we're talking Nintendo uh, you know sort of overhead view game but now it was a third person shooter type like you were in the world you were climbing around you were sneaking around people it it, it, it was it brought a whole new dimension to a game and yet it called back to all those little things that you loved about the original um, and so yeah when when they said that they were going to redo that and um, you know I was going to have an opportunity to to do liquid snake I was thrilled um, 
it was again I loved the project I loved working with that staff it was great because you know I then got to work with them again on Snake Eater um, playing Colonel Volgan um, again uh, a lot of fun I'll, I will I will say Liquid Snake has, has a little special place in my heart I, I loved playing Liquid Snake Colonel Volgan was cool but Liquid Snake was awesome um, and it's actually funny because uh, Metal Gear Solid 2 was the first time that they used uh, motion capture actors for the movie sequences. The original was all done by hand. And so it wasn't until the remake, which was after Metal Gear Solid 2, that I had an opportunity to work on it. The reason I really decided, you know, I need to quit teaching and I need to become a full-time stuntman was because I was originally considered for the role of Vamp in Metal Gear Solid 2, but I had just signed a teaching contract and I, there was no way I was going to be able to to go to a, you know however many months of shooting. So basically, I kicked myself over and over really, really hard and decided that, damn it, I'm become a professional stuntman. So, the, yeah, Metal Gear Solid has a, has a special place in my heart um, in terms of the impetus to, to just start working in this industry. And again, as a great project to have been involved with. Awesome, awesome. Hope to see you in another one sometime. But speaking of which, let's wrap this up. What can we see from Mark Musashi down the line? Well, a uh, couple things. Uh, in terms of bigger name movies, uh, there's Mars Needs Moms which is uh, coming out, it's a uh, Disney film, um, a lot of um, basically digital um, motion capture technology uh, to tell a story. Uh, I did a little bit of the um, motion capture work, uh, various, you know, running around as aliens, getting knocked down, pulled around, lifting people, whatnot. Um, so, I'd say check that out. Uh, another film is, I uh, actually had an opportunity to do a little bit of work on Thor, which was awesome. Um, <laughs> this is my first, you know, big Marvel comic superhero movie, uh, which is, you know, I guess the, the American equivalent to, to doing tokusatsu. So that was a blast. Uh, I got to, to you know, work with, with people there, and uh, I got to see Anthony Hopkins in person. Didn't really talk to him, but I got to see him, and that was awesome. Just saying. Uh, and then, what other projects we... Well, uh, there's an independent film that I did a while back uh, called Welcome Back Satan. Uh, I play Jesus. Uh, and it's been in post-production for a while now. I'm um, hoping that it'll come out sometime this year. Um, we'll see. And then, I guess, other than that, uh, you know, keep your eyes and ears open and uh, see what uh, see what else I'm up to. Uh, if you want to keep up to date, shameless plug. Uh, you can check out my website. Uh, it's uh, www.markmusashi.com. End of shameless plug. Um, but basically, you know, I'll I'll uh, update that as well, as well as I can, just to say you know what I've done and what's coming up. Um, and yeah, other than that, I'm I'm here in LA, and I'm uh, I'm hoping to see what I can get involved in and uh, see what the uh, future holds. Well, Mark, it's been a real pleasure and a real honor to talk to you. It is so awesome. You are the man. I cannot thank you enough for taking time out of your schedule. And I know myself and a lot of the other Toku faithful cannot wait to see you in action again, doing what you do best. Thank you so much. You are so awesome. Hopefully we can have you on the show again sometime. Well, that's it for this edition of Talking Toku. I'm Easy Rider. And I'm Mark Musashi. Later. Later.
I'm gonna go check my phone. I'll be right back. Sorry about that.